Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're so excited you're here with us. Um, please know that if you have a question, um, you are welcome to ask it in the chat at any time and we'll get to it towards the end. Um, and you are, you know, you're welcome to take your own notes, but we did just want to let you know that this session will be recorded and posted online. So my name is Lydia Sauten and I am a chair of the CRMCX Society. I'm going to give a quick intro and then pass over to Kelly, who is the chair of the International Business Society. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about TAG. TAG's mission is to connect, promote, influence, and educate Georgia's technology ecosystem to advance the innovation economy. And so the, through those four pillars, TAG serves to support, grow, and ignite tech leaders, companies, and the overall Georgia economy. And so that means that they bring that to life through us, through our 26 plus professional societies with our over 30,000 members, and we put on events like this one. They're usually about 150 a year. And we actually have five statewide chapters as well. Each of our societies are supported by society sponsors and they support us all year long. So we wanted to give a quick shout out to both the International Business Society as well as our TAG CRM and CX Society. So thank you everyone for um, joining us and thank you to our sponsors again. And what I'd like to do is also pass it over, let me get this going here, to Kelly Brock, who was just speaking. So Kelly, as I mentioned, is a chair of the International Business Society and she is also the Customer Experience and Loyal Direct Loyalty Director at UPS. And she will be um, moderating today. And so, Kelly, do you um, want to say a few words before we move to our intros? Yes, thank you so much, Lydia. Just want to say thank you all to our panelists, our esteemed panelists who are in, here today joining us to give their insights and wisdom. And then also to the attendees, thank you for your support of this uh, webinar and also to TAG. So without further ado, we are going to do a quick introduction of our esteemed panelists. So we'll kick it off with Joseph Bagui. Uh, he's also from UPS, and he's also my boss, FYI, everyone out there. So uh, please be kind for any questions you have for Joseph. So Joseph, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Kelly. Uh, so Joseph Bagui, I, I lead the uh, customer experience efforts at UPS, uh, mainly focused on the U.S. market, but have uh, touch points throughout our subsidiaries and, and our global uh, footprint. And uh, um, re really my background uh, in supply chain over the last 20 years at, at UPS has been uh, really in the field in, in both operations and uh, in sales. And I, and I think I bring a unique perspective uh, now taking over this role of, of customer experience because I have both uh, the customer perspective uh, coming from the sales side as well as uh, um, the operations and the execution side of the house. So took over CX um, uh, uh, mid last year. And um, a, a few uh, quick facts about me. Uh, first generation American. So both my parents immigrated uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the 70s here. Um, I had moved to three countries uh, by the time I was uh, seven years old. I lived in Europe and the Middle East. Um, I have moved 33 times uh, and, and counting. And then really four in the last four years uh, through my journey at UPS. Um, and then uh, I speak multiple language, uh, languages and uh, I, I enjoy uh, cycling with my family. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Joseph. So we're now gonna move on to Dave Curry, who's the CEO of Winmo. Dave, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Certainly. Good afternoon to everyone on the, on the call today. My name is Dave Curry. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of a sales intelligence company called Winmo. We operate in two major markets, uh, the US obviously and the UK. We also have uh, business operations that expand into APAC and EMEA uh, and the EU for clients in those uh, respective markets. I'm the, uh, I'm the international Australian candidate for the panel today. Uh, born and raised in Sydney and on the mid north coast of New South Wales. Uh, have been in the US for the last 15 years and uh, have been with this organization through its various iterations from a private company to one owned by and backed by private equity. Um, I 
oversee all of the, uh, or much of the operational side of customer experience. And I was really uh, excited to, to listen to the other panelists on this webinar and also contribute where I can in terms of my perspective from a small to mid-sized organization in the tech space that uh, has to sort of transcend those boundaries and, and work on customer experience in, in different markets as well. So thank you for, uh, for having me on the call. Um, outside of speaking Australian, Canadian and uh, an American, uh, I also studied Japanese for several years, so I'm fun to have at a, uh, a sushi restaurant. I can order pretty well. Love that. Fantastic. And Sydney is so beautiful. Um, but I bet you haven't been back in a while, given everything that's going on uh, in, in the world today. Thank you, Dave. So next up, um, our next esteemed panelist is Lakaisha from uh, Cox, and she is the Director of Customer Care there. Would you mind introducing yourself? Lakeisha? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. So hello, everyone. My name is Lakaisha Lang, and as it says, I am the Director of Customer Care in one of our uh, five call centers, and my particular home base is in Virginia. Um, my team handles pretty much all of the customer inquiries that come in uh, related to our products and services in an inbound call center. Um, my particular team in Virginia also manages all of our social media platforms. Um, I've been with the company going on four years, but I've been in the industry for about 27 years. Um, a huge customer advocate, ensuring that we're doing everything possible to make sure that the customers have what they need. Um, in my spare time, I enjoy whale watching. Um, I don't know if we have any avid whale watchers out there, but I love whale watching and spending time with my family. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Diane. Diane, would you please introduce yourself? Oh, my pleasure. It's so great to be here today. Thanks, everyone. Um, yes, I've been in the customer experience space for um, well over almost three decades now. Um, currently, a strategic advisor with McQuarrie. I'm a design firm based in Atlanta. Um, I have worked in and with many organizations, um, worked in AT&T in the B2B space at Cisco Foods for quite some time. So large, complex organizations, but also lots of startups and organizations that are trying to build this discipline. Um, most recently, up until about a year ago, I was CEO for the Customer Experience Professionals Association. So a great organization, little plug. Um, if you're wanting to learn more in this space, it's a great place to go and find your community. Um, fun facts, I didn't run my first triathlon until I was 50, so that was quite a feat. Um, I was also an exchange student to Australia in high school, so uh, I've been back several times and love it. So Dave, there's our crossover. And uh, some people don't know, I have a brown belt in Taekwondo, and I actually began my career as a psychologist. So I've always been in the human behavior piece, and you'll probably hear a lot of that come out um, in our conversation today. I love that you did your first triathlon at 50. That's, that's fantastic. Congratulations. And I'm still in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Diane. And last up, last but not certainly not least, we have Pilar. Pilar, would you introduce yourself as well? Sure. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I am Pilar Garcia. Uh, I've been in the operations and change management customer service basically my whole career. So I bring, similar to Dave, I bring an operational background, uh, primarily working with uh, multinationals since, since the beginning. I've been with uh, General Electric, uh, Chiquita Brands, Georgia Pacific, so um, uh, lately with, uh, and the last one with Cox Enterprises. So primarily working in a multinational, multicultural um, environment. Um, and I work uh, both here in North and Latin America and in Europe. So if you haven't picked up my accent yet, uh, I'm not from around here. Uh, so I was born and raised in Spain, um, came to the United States to go to college and uh, got married uh, to somebody from, from here. So that's how uh, I ended up staying here in the United States. Uh, we have two daughters and currently living here in Atlanta. Also have traveled a lot for my job um, here and overseas. Um, right now settle, settle here in Atlanta. So in my current role with Emirates, they are a uh, industrial minerals company um, based out of, uh, out of Europe, out of France. Uh, they are in 50 countries. So my job here is primarily North America, US, Canada, Mexico, and I am directing all of their transformation programs um, right now. So the common link has been across all the different projects is the customer and the employee experience. Throughout every transformation that I've worked on, 
uh, the primary focus of uh, Centricity was around customer, around the employee, making sure that whatever we do um, is that that experience is ultimately intact and, and improved. So um, I am um, looking forward to participating and hearing the other angles. Well, thank you, Pilar, and thank you again to the panelists and attendees. And we're going to get right, get started right away. We have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Uh, you're in for a, a treat from these panelists. They've got a wealth of experience and knowledge to share with you all today. So we're really going to try to get through five key trends that these panelists have identified as being key items to discuss during these challenging times. And Pilar, you really uh, gave a great segue or intro because the first trend or topic we want to embark on uh, is really employee engagement. Given these challenging times, we know how important it is from a CX perspective to have increased employee engagement. So can you talk about how you are approaching education, training, hiring, and maintaining really a culture um, with your employees globally? So we'd love to hear um, from the panelists on this. And I think, Diane, um, this might be an area that you are particularly um, fond of and interested in sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll start. Uh, Dave's going to weigh in, too, and he's got some great examples. So I, I think it's important to think about, you know, the employee experience has been about how the employee interacts with the brand. And this engagement piece is where we really start to talk about the emotions and how they feel about, um, especially the nowadays as things have changed so much. So I think it's important to really define what, what those things are. So that said, um, we, we find a lot of organizations today who are obviously doubling down with kind of listening to their employees. But we've got some companies that we're observing are really taking that next step and actually teaching design thinking and using this as a as, as a time to really think about change management and being more proactive about the change management, really designing the new experiences for their employees. Um, everything from how they come back to work to how are they gonna balance work life um, as they move forward. So I think we're gonna see, continue to see more and more organizations who are putting some very tactical things in place with a very purposeful culture shift. Like we talk about kind of maintaining the culture I think this is a perfect time where organizations, everything's kind of in the air. What do we need to do to be thinking about what we want the organization to be and how we're gonna care for both the effectiveness but also the well-being of employees as we move forward. Dave, do you have a couple of examples around that? Yeah, I think that it's a, a great way to, to dive into that. I think it's been a really challenging time for all employees. Um, I've, I've been thinking about today's panel, I was looking at our own organization uh, globally and looking at there's really two camps of um, employee engagement and the employee experience right now. There's those who are operational that are in support roles with uh, their customers being internal customers. And then you've got the other segment, which is on in, in the customer service, the external customer service roles. And they've both got very different levels of engagement and stresses in their lives. Um, so, so I think the common thread between those two camps of employees is um, what I've always believed, which is to a great customer experience and a great uh, for both internal and external is built on a great foundation of culture within an organization, both at a team level and at a company level. And for us, it comes down to making sure that we're really clear on what our brand promise is to any customer, whether it's an internal or an external customer taking those core values and making sure that we're really clear, especially in with current affairs, with what the expected behaviors are around those core values. This is what it manifests like in real life. Here's a real life example of what, uh, what that core value looks like and feels like and should be experienced like. Um, and then I think that the autonomy uh, and the delegation of authority to challenge that has been something that we've been experimenting with much more frequently in, in recent months, because we've almost had a, a permission to, from both, from either of those customers, internal or external, to experiment and get it wrong and move on and do something different. I think that's been probably one of the biggest changes um, in terms of employee engagement. We've seen teams lean in to own that and participate like never before, which has been great to see. Great, great points. Um, 
And I know um, from a UPS perspective, we really shifted and shifted. And Joseph, you talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, we, when we initially uh, talked with the panel, we've done, we pivoted for some things in terms of training um, at UPS as well. Um, Joseph, from a, from a technology standpoint, would you talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> uh, you, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, I, one, one of the, um, pieces uh, uh, of that is you know what, what can we um, uh, what can we learn from from uh, some of the um... yeah Joseph I was thinking about uh, what we've done with our drivers virtually um, to onboard them and train them quickly um, kind of given no, what is happening today thanks thanks for thanks for jogging my memory there <laughs> sorry yeah, yeah sorry so about that <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that that we did have to do um, on uh, for our drivers specifically is we it's a traditionally very heavy touch point um, uh, training. So there's there's uh, uh, a, a an actual classroom workroom uh, relationship, uh, a lot of hands on training uh, that we do with our drivers, and, and we've actually had to shift that to a virtual environment. So very quick adaptation. Um, uh, from from that group, and and what we've also done uh, is actually incorporate uh, more customer experience um, uh, measurements in, into that as well. So as we are listening to our customers on a customer experience perspective, we're pulling that in and saying, here's some of the key things our customers are saying uh, that that continue to be pain points for them, and how do we incorporate this um, into uh, the uh, uh, into the training, right? Um, so we can reinforce some of the key learnings that the drivers are coming out with, not only improve um, uh, the, those those folks that are coming out, uh, but but you know as we're re also reinforcing in in the um, uh, in, in the uh, actual um, uh, you know process that that we have going on in operations today. So no, but uh, no, thanks for jogging my memory on that, Kelly. But but. I think that's just one of many, many things that that uh, you know our organizations and many others are are having to think about differently um, as as we have to you know consider uh, the times that we live in today. Absolutely. If I, if I could just add, one of the things we're also doing, sort of what um, Joseph mentioned, is reviewing our survey comments from our customers um, after they take a survey from interacting with us, um, and we're really leveraging our NPS Net Promoter Scores to really understand what could be driving that customer sentiment about their interaction with us. And are there things that we can do to improve some of our processes based on what they're experiencing, um, where things we thought were working really well or as smooth as can be, they are coming back in through the surveys telling us that there are some things that we probably need to work out. Absolutely, absolutely. I think monitoring that, those NPS scores and the pulse of your customer is critically important during this um, you know, challenging time with the global pandemic. All right, let's shift a little bit and let's talk, we, we've touched on this somewhat, let's talk about embracing technology. Um, how are your companies, employees, and your customers embracing technology differently? I know right now we're actually all on Zoom, so probably mm -hmm. many of you are embracing some of these Zoom type technology video conferencing more so than you ever have. So, um, Lakaisha, we'd love to hear from you from, from Cox on that perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, COVID-19 was the uh, impetus for us accelerating a lot of the things that we thought about that were already on the table for us to kind of push forward, but um, that sort of accelerated it a little bit. <laughs> and so uh, what I will share is that, you know, one of the great things about the culture at Cox is when we're faced with rapid changes, we rise to the occasion. And the way we've been able to do that for our employees, for example, is we went from about 15% of our employees being work at home employees to 97% now in a work at home state in a three week period. Um, and that would not have been possible if we hadn't been able to leverage a lot of our technology teams. Um, we sort of went to this model of call center in a box. And with, with that partnership with IT and our technology teams, we were able to take the equipment that the employee was gonna need, um, make sure that the telephones worked so when they got home, all they needed to do was plug and play. Um, and we also provided how-to instructions so that they knew how to plug in a monitor into the device or knew how to launch Microsoft Teams once they got home. 
And so that has been instrumental in allowing us to be able to get to that 97% in a short amount of time. We've also um, relied a lot on our existing tools. So our intranet, our online training, um, we also have a knowledge base where our employees go to see all up-to-date um, information and changes to some of our processes. So um, we've accelerated how much information now we offer in those three different areas. Because now, as you can imagine, our employees can no longer swivel to someone next to them and say, hey, can you help me with this particular issue? They're pretty much on their own when they go home and have to rely on technology to reach out to their teams and supervisors and such. So, you know, with that, we surveyed our employees and, you know, as we continue to be in this virtual space, um, we sort of wanted to get a pulse check on how many employees were appreciating um, working from home. And 79% said that they would prefer to stay, stay at home. And wow. many of them at first were very nervous about doing it and saying that, oh my God, this is not for me. But that, that percentage there tells you that people have become accustomed to it are comfortable with the technology that's out there, and they are willing to remain in that space. Um, from a company perspective, you know, we've always had Microsoft Teams, we've always had Skype, so we're continuing to leverage those platforms, so, but we've, we've added an additional component of engagement. So we're heavily engaged there where we're doing fun videos or we're sharing family pictures just to keep that connection going. And from a company, excuse me, from a, a uh, work at home stance, um, the, the technologies have helped us to reduce absenteeism. Um, employees are very comfortable using the tools that they have. We have more remote support solutions for them um, so they can reach out over, um, over chat and things like that. Um, in addition to that, in our field space, we're using more remote support solutions as well. So we can assist the customer outside of the home, not always having to go in because of the current state we're in. Um, and leveraging some of the, the technology that's out there to do that, to continue to troubleshoot as well as install our customers. So we've, we've, we've accelerated, um, but we've, we've st st stood true to the things that we've already been doing. I think I was, I was surprised as, uh, as many have been in terms of the, um, the preconceived notion that productivity may go down with, uh, with a work from home environment. We just haven't seen that at all. In fact, we've seen the, the opposite of that. Productivity has gone up. Um, and the IT teams have been the unsung heroes that you know, get no recognition normally unless something's broken. And yeah. uh, a really good way to tie your uh, employee engagement and customer experience into uh, embracing technology is just how smoothly that went for so many teams. Yeah. The, the employees are expressing that they don't have as many distractions anymore. Um, when they were in the office, someone walking up to their cubicle to say hi while they're, you know, trying to interact with a customer. Now they're fully focused on that one call at a time. And, and we've seen, as you mentioned, Dave, some really great results in our performance. Thank you, Lakasha. Great stats that you shared um, as well. Um, Pilar, anything you'd like to add on, on this subject? Sure. So we've seen the same things. Um, in addition, you know, we do manage uh, projects across a multitude of countries. And um, what was kind of interesting and a trend that we've seen um, happening, not just in, pr even prior to the pandemic, was that the, um, I guess, the cultural differences in terms of, you know, adoption of tools, they continue to get smaller and smaller. Meaning, I think as the newer generations, especially, I mean, I'm sure social media has played a big role. Uh, the new generations are a bigger percentage of the workforce. We are seeing, you know, what I used to see 20 years ago when I started my career, you know, there were huge, huge cultural differences and we had to adjust strategy every time something happened. We're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing that we're just more and more alike. Um, I think it's information, you know, has really played a role. So, um, but what holds true here in the United States um, is in terms of embracing technology holds true in Mexico and Canada, meaning that the difference has to do more with the way you utilize uh, technology. For example, we see a huge difference with uh, uh, home office uh, employees versus people at the plant level, or, you know, a UPS could be your drivers. You know, these are folks that right. may not be in front of a computer. So we have to do some adjustment um, on that. Um, and focus our attention more on that group that we didn't want to be uh, left out 
Um, so uh, we took sort of like a baby step to technology. So for example, we wanted to capture the feedback. So a couple of things we've done is we are utilizing, uh, we are uh, a Google shop at Emirates. So we're utilizing Google Forms. Uh, so at their own pace, they could submit feedback, uh, give us some commentary. So we're getting a lot of great employee feedback uh, via that. And that's an easy tool for them to use something that they're comfortable and embracing versus using something a little bit more formal. Um, and also, um, we have also a ticketing system. So the, the, the ticketing system that we use for IT, we're using now for employee experience to submit feedback. Uh, so, so that way we don't leave the um, NASA technology savvy employees um, out of the picture. But again, that trend, uh, which has been really, you know, um, it's a good surprise is, is those, those, those gaps across, you know, across countries continue to be smaller and smaller. So especially with some of the uh, newer, the, the um, latest generations, um, it's almost like the cultural differences do not exist. You know, they're very, very minor. Uh, so that's, that's a positive, you know, in terms of uh, potential international growth. I love that, Pilar. It's like technology has made us one global community. Yeah, um, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. it was in, Pilar, it was interesting for us to see how many more employees had to, had to become more comfortable with a uh, video conference like this yeah. rather than just joining a, a conference call. Um, it, it, it accelerated a lot of that adoption, certainly, especially in, uh, in other markets. Yes, yes, they're really embracing it. They're, you know, they're decorating their, their rooms. So it's, you know, we're having a lot of fun with, with it. Yeah, we actually um, purchased cameras for all of our employees um, in mm -hmm. our call centers just so we can ensure that we kept that engagement going. And as you mentioned, we're doing a lot around um, engagement activities so that they can feel comfortable even more with using um, the video component. Yeah, I will say it is pretty amazing when you turn on the camera, it does feel like you're all really almost in the same room up virtually. Mm -hmm. So um, it, 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 it doesn't feel, you don't, I don't feel far away from my um, team or our clients or customers when we're engaging. So it's, Embracing technology certainly has helped us, um, both from an employee standpoint and a customer experience standpoint at UPS. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, our next trend or digital transformation and, and really adoption. And, and we've touched on it already um, in, in our last discussion point, but digitally we are seeing, you know, really rapid transformation in various forms, including social media adoption, e-commerce increase. We certainly see that at UPS remote technology and, and more. Um, so I just wanted to, to dive a little bit deeper into this in terms of how you're addressing it with your clients or your customers as well. Um, any thoughts uh, uh, on that, um, uh, Lakaisha or, or Joseph? Yeah, I can start uh, and then I'll pass it off. But, uh, you know, one, one of the things, uh, you know, when we think about the digital transformation you know, when we think about our salespeople and how we traditionally engage in the field, some of our larger, we, we sell a lot on, on solutions and, and, and value uh, additional, you know, things that we can bring in. Uh, one of the things we've done to, to support our employees and then, and then ultimately is the virtual consultations, right? So it's kind of building off of what we just talked about, some of the, the virtual pieces, but, but, uh, you know, standing up a process that allows us to to engage with with our customers that that we hadn't traditionally done. Um, so that that's something that we're supporting our employees with. But when we think about our clients, and and I think back to even customer experience and and the things that we're doing on on some of the redesign. And and as customers, uh, you know, we 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 had a uh, uh, I guess a roadmap of what we thought the traditional to digital customers would be over the next five years. Obviously, that, that has been moved up quite a bit. But when we think about customer experience and our clients and, and some of the rework that we're doing it is really to look at digital first, right? So if we have multiple channels that a customer is engaging us with, um, when we're redesigning or working on a, a specific project and in, in a journey that they have is how do you do that digital first? Because that, it's a, it's a improvement for, for the customer as well as improvement for us. And I'll give you just one example of, of um, something that we're doing with, with our claims. Now, hopefully nobody has to have done a claims uh, pr uh, claim with UPS, but, but it hasn't been a, the, the best experience and it, and it, it doesn't necessarily work at, uh, uh, consistently through all the different channels. So as we're looking to improve 
that overall experience and we look to improve through this digital transformation process. We're starting, uh, um, uh, you know, digital first. Uh, we're looking at uh, online and, and it's a, you know, it's a win for us as, a, um, as an organization because it's a lower cost for us, but it's a win for the customer as well because it creates a very consistent experience for them and, and uh, um, an improved experience overall. Yeah, great points, Joseph. I think from our perspective in purely B2B and working in the advertising media industry specifically, um, what we've been able to do is also sort of reduce those response times with getting back to customers with um, a question they may have or a, a, an issue they may have, but also being able to then use digital tools to customize that, that, um, that response based on their persona, um, their organization, understand the nuances of where that person fits within an organization and make proactive proactive suggestions on how to in, enhance or surprise and delight that customer versus just solving the issue that they originally came in to uh, to question. So it's been a big area of, uh, of opportunity that we've been able to capitalize on, especially given the, uh, the tools that are available today versus maybe you know even two or three years ago. And for our customers, we're really focusing on the self-service aspect of our dig digital channels. Um, specifically the app enabled support. So for example, a customer can check their own data usage without having to call in. They can reset their modem without having to call into us. They can take a look at, you know, their, they can get a link through to their email so that they don't have to go into m m many different platforms to, to make access to that. We're driving bot enabled solutions that make it easier for customers to complete some of the tasks like paying a bill um, so that they don't have to log in separately. Um, we're also, um, for example, um, with our employees, we're taking a more trust the tool approach. Um, so we have tools, uh, guided tools, troubleshooting tools that they use when interacting with our customers that help them diagnose the issue. And a lot of stuff happens on the back in the background. Um, and so we're, you know, asking our employees to really trust the tools so that they can get to a reasonable resolution and so that we have consistent troubleshooting across all of our call centers. Um, it's more of like a one-stop shop approach because as people choose different platforms to interact with us, um, we have to be laser focused to make sure that our customers can reach us in their preferred channel of choice. Yeah, great point. And, and just to add on to what all of the uh, great points that you've all made, you know, UPS, we're seeing, uh, obviously call center volume has increased during these times. We're seeing a lot of e-commerce, a lot of people um, buying online now. Uh, so call volume has increased. So sometimes there are a little bit longer wait times. So certainly we've seen social media engagement from our customers or our clients increase as well as they leverage that channel. So it's really interesting that we're kind of seeing both uh, trends on both the social media side as well as, as the call center side where customers are using those platforms and really saying the same things in, in both those two channels. Mm -hmm. stronger adoption on both sides. So um, love that they can, uh, what they're doing at Cox, where you can do a lot of self-resolution. I, I know uh, a lot of people want to self-serve these day, this day and age, no matter where you are in what country. Um, so yeah, gr great points. Yeah, their time is valuable and they often don't want to sit on the phone. So if we can give mm -hmm. them options that they can do on their own, they're, they're loving every minute of it. From a global perspective, having those uh, international call zones and time zones to, to chat, there's, there's an added layer of complexity. Um, one of the things that we've seen our customers roll out more on the, on the tech and ad space has been um, the similar technology that someone like Delta Airlines will call you back when it's your turn versus sitting on hold, which has been what we've understood to be a, ma a game changer for so many. Here are the self-serve options, or we can call you back at a time when it's, uh, when it's your placement in line. Yeah, just really upping your customer experience game so they are waiting or you're minimize, minimizing the waiting time as much as possible and trying to make it that in a, in a, in a situation that's convenient, in an inconvenient time potentially. So, Yes, so um, Diane, I just, just wanted to get your thoughts um, here quickly on how companies can better gauge the return of investment of CX um, and what are the key pain points we're seeing out there? in terms of, uh, and how we can better engage customers uh, for those pain points in particular? Uh, I think the question was twofold. So one is how do you really think about that, that value? So all the things you're thinking about with, with creating those easier touch points and saving customers time and creating that value, 
all add up to the way we make customers feel like. That was pretty easy. That was efficient. There's that brand promise that gets delivered to Dave's point. And I think that people kind of miss this whole, while you're looking at pain points and while you're making all these technology changes, you are changing the mindset and the behavior of your customer, meaning they're more likely if you fix their issue to call back, to stay longer. That's what really drives revenue. So this whole financial piece of we think about just fixing pain points, but every engagement that everybody's shared has really changed how the customer's communicating with you. And it builds that trust, especially in a time of need. And that, that's really where organizations are really facing. It's that, it's that longer term relationship. If you're able to fix their problem in a very quick and easy way, that drives the business results. And then I think you asked me something about pain points and how to address those. Did I answer yes, that? yes. Yeah. Um, so I think- We're a little bit of feedback, Diane, on, oh. Diane, on your sound, just FYI. It's... Okay. Is that better? Yes, much better, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're asking about uh, the pain points. I, I think that we just have to take a different view of where customers are today. So I can't imagine being in the service area these days, even with all these new tools, because I think consumers and customers are obviously more emotionally charged when they're interacting with the brand. And so we have to be extremely careful about how we handle those situations. Not only do you have an employee and a customer who are kind of on edge and their world has shifted, so how do we really care for that? And so I think those pain points, we're gonna see um, them become much more visual because of the intensity of the emotion behind it. So you'll be watching for those and where things are really gonna bubble up are the things that have always been important, but while that was a nagging feeling before, probably now rising to the top of the, of the heap. So it's actually reprioritized where we should focus. One of the things we've done um, at Cox in relation to that, Diane, is we've really honed in on our brand promise. And so our brand promise is very much tied to the customer experience. And we've, we've sort of embodied what we call the Cox attitude. And the Cox attitude um, encompasses, I care, I'm ready, and I've got this. And so when you think about those three aspects of the Cox attitude, it helps the employee understand that when interacting with our customers, those three things are so important where you show, that the, show the customer that you care about them and you understand what they're going through, that you've got all the tools you need to solve their issue and that together, that the two of you are gonna work through the resolution. So we're really, really excited about what we've seen from results from our teams in embodying the Cox attitude. And it's really helped in terms of customer response to us resolving their issues. Yes, that's really cool. That's a great um, come to life story. Yeah. That we'll just talk about. Yes, I love that. Um, so the next trend I wanted to talk specifically about is being agile. Um, we've talked about these turbulent times, very different than anything we've all experienced. We know everything is changing rapidly. Um, so just love to hear about from a customer experience and a global standpoint, how you are responding in an agile manner. So Joseph, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so you know what your customers expected yesterday are not what they're gonna expect tomorrow and in, in, in these times of obviously um, changed um, uh, those expectations. One of the things we did at UPS is, is stood up um, what we're calling a sprint process, right? Some of these big rocks that uh, we've continued to be challenged with within the organization and traditionally some of our projects have been multi-year large uh, legacy platforms that we're trying to change and, and uh, one of the things the, the customer experience team is trying to do is, is take a much more agile approach on, on how to move these big rocks, how to make incremental um, uh, adjustments or changes to, to that journey. And uh, what we found is, is uh, we, one, it's, it's given us better financial metrics to, to measure so we can get some of those ultimate long-term uh, changes made. Uh, but it also cr uh, creates a uh, one, you know, improved experience for, for that, uh, you know, the incremental changes, and then and then um, um, builds um, really some uh, foundational work that we can use uh, to to move that that forward. So look for incremental opportunities uh, that you can that you can move uh, within within the organization and move in a in a rapid pace. Uh, because, uh, you know, the customers are expecting that and, and they're, they're looking for that change. 
Yeah, great points, great points. Um, Dave, any, any thoughts? Um, yeah, from your I, I would um, I absolutely agree with what Joseph was saying in terms of moving to Sprint. We, uh, we borrowed the terminology and the methodology from our engineering development team. They've been working in an agile environment and been um, singing the praises of, of working in an agile state for, uh, for a long time. Uh, it wasn't really until we moved into a need to re-examine all of our processes to be more flexible, to make changes faster, and to understand what those changes were in terms of impact to the organization that we'd rolled it out through the entire organization. So um, we also then moved from, okay, what's the term of a sprint? So we looked at, should it be a month? Should it be three weeks, two weeks, a week? What does that actually look like? So right now we work on two week sprints. Everything is, everything is reviewed and broken down into small two week sprints um, across marketing, customer success, and they're usually part of a, a longer, what their team would call an epic story or a mission or whatever the task is or project we're trying to complete. It's all broken down into two week increments, which is, it's been phenomenal in terms of being able to experiment. Uh, and if something doesn't go right or it goes unexpectedly different, <laughs> um, we can change it and it doesn't have long term impact. Um, and as I said earlier, we've got, I think, more um, acceptance of. Uh, of flexibility in trying to just do things differently than than you know any time in in my professional experience in the past too. I, I love hearing you doing two week sprints. That's certainly a pretty aggressive timeline. And and are you doing that across uh, UK, US, Australia as well globally? From a global we are. Everyone's been open to trying it. So if it's not working, if sprints in two weeks itself isn't working then change it to three weeks and if that's not working change it to four weeks i think the the very under just understanding the very nature of uh, using that methodology to examine the process itself has been helpful and it's been that's that's allowed us to um, have more adoption it's like let's just give this a go if it doesn't work we'll change it so yeah, yeah. it's worked really well in other markets and we've also taken the approach of uh, just selecting certain certain companies or certain entities um, and utilizing, we, we, for example, we have utilized RPA very, very heavily. So utilizing RPA, taking a company that or entity that uh, we know we could do something very quickly and then do a little showcase, um, you know, a particular country with a particular entity and that has created momentum. So put all, in, in, instead of spreading, multinationals typically are, you know, they're slow to move. So it's, we're taking all of the resources are called the different countries and, and just, just, you know, honing into a market, um, utilizing our PA, uh, we've been able to be really successful. I think what's, what's helped with this is really just common sense approach to management, which has been smaller increments mm -hmm. um, of time measure and smaller increments of success measure, which allows to give more recognition more frequently to employees. So it's sort of a, a cascading effect of, of positive momentum. We're not moving a huge boulder very far down the field in two weeks. It might just be that it rolled over a quarter of a turn, but we celebrate that. And then we can recognize individual contributions in that period. And then on we go and on we go. And it just builds, um, which is what we're all looking for. It's incremental improvement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and with that, hopefully faster, res responding to the market um, and customer needs and customer experience in a, a better and more agile way. So um, the last trend that we wanted to talk about um, is empathy. And, and we've touched on it already today, but I do still want to bring it to the forefront because it's so important um, during these times um, to really express empathy, not only in a business environment, but also on a personal level. Um, so how are you addressing this? you know, how are you addressing empathy and, and what are some of the best practices that you can share? Um, and, and Diane, I'm looking specifically at you uh, to help uh, help respond to this question, please. Sure, sure. Well, I, I just wanted to call it for Dave and, and everybody who's shared some of these things. I think one of the things when you think about empathy is making sure that you you really understand what your employees are going through. And I think that recognition you talked about, Dave, is so important. It should be a time for celebration that organizations have always wanted to be more agile collaborative and innovative and this has just given us the catalyst to go do that so it's really creating new rituals in the organization and that's difficult for people you know they're not used to that pace but i think if we capitalize on that momentum and the way people are feeling about that wow we don't have all these legacy things hanging on to us people work for big companies it's like this big sloth trying to get through things 
And this has really showed us that we can, we can really change how we, how we work and the rituals and how people are feeling about coming to work. Think about that. How is it, how is it to come to work now when it used to be like the same old thing day after day and now things are moving quicker and they're being there. So we have to kind of put ourselves in those shoes and start to appreciate. Um, so one of the best practices, for example, we're seeing is people are using design techniques like appreciative inquiry to really understand what are the things that we're doing and identify those and call them out and create stories around them. Um, we're seeing a lot of organizations who are doing what I would call, I called it my, um, my isolation transformation is a great way to put it. Like talking about what people have actually gone through personally um, through this challenge, both with the company and their personal lives. Because I think people, we kind of go through the day to day and we don't reflect enough to really understand what our employees are going through. So giving them a chance to really tell that story. And storytelling is one of my big, big advice. So at the end, when you ask that. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot more of that social support, more of that emotional engagement for employees and really understanding where they are. Everybody's kind of doing you know, more employee surveys now, really trying to understand where the employees are, but bringing that to life through Zoom webinars, through um, discussions with the leaders, having the leaders tell their vulnerable stories is a really great way for organizations to really move forward. So we, we wanna celebrate those things and really bring that to life. And that's through the empathy of what, what the changes are creating for all of us individually. David. You know, one, one thing, I, um, <laughs> one, one thing I, yes, I, that we're also seeing and I, I know that uh, I think a lot of you have run interviews in the past. So I, I want the session to also be interactive. So we'll, I'll share some tips, but feel free to jump in also with some tips that you have. Uh, so I, it sounds like we have a question from one of our uh, attendees. So um, I think if I heard you correctly, there's a little bit of feedback. You're asking if there's some tips that, that can be shared. Is that correct? Just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I quite captured that question um, accurately. Um, but but Joseph, I, I, I know you were talking. Were there any tips that you wanted to share in particular that, yeah, that would no, be helpful to the audience? Yeah, no. I, what I was going to say is, you know, when we talk about empathy, but but our customers actually on some of the customer feedback, um, we have a lot of unsung heroes out there, right? So utilizing um, the customer feedback for for opportunities for recognition and, and you know part of the processes we're standing up and, and reviewing for coaching, but 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 what we're finding out is that you know, tons of our employees are always doing the right thing, creating great customer experiences, um, and, and then utilizing that, uh, you know, really part of our training is utilizing that to recognize our employees, right? How do you create that halo effect with customer experience feedback uh, across your entire work week? And then, and then how do you use that uh, to, to really, um, you know, in, in trying times, propel, uh, propel your, your employees forward, right? So, um, we, we've seen great success with that in, in, in the field, um, and uh, you know we and our our customers have a lot of great things to say about uh, so many of uh, our employees out, out there as well. Exactly right, Joseph. It's a management philosophy of look for the good every day, and and do something about it. <laughs> yeah. So at um, at Emirates, one of the things that we do is when we jump on a call. Uh, we spent intentionally the first five minutes is listening to the different people and how they're coping uh, with, the, with this situation. For example, in Latin America, quite often people live in smaller spaces. Sometimes they share the space with extended family. So um, we hear from them, you know, some of the just, just ins and outs of how they're coping and how they're handling. And what we do is when we jump on a call, we typically have people from different countries one of the things that we do is we talked about some of the best practices that we've heard from other countries in terms of how they're coping. So um, as an example, we have heard that um, especially it's very difficult to have some uh, calls where everybody's interacting in the middle of the day. So we are adjusting the schedules. We're, we're having shorter meetings, sometimes 15, 20 minutes that people will get in and out very quickly, as well as doing some 7 a.m. calls, 6.30, 7.00. Uh, and that is working very well. And, and needless to say, it's really interesting to hear how the different countries are adjusting. Um, I mean, this is the first time in my, in my career where, you know, 
we have the same problem across all the different countries. So that has really bonded us and also helped us understand how can we take into consideration the different, the different uh, cultural differences in working together, um, you know, as a team, as a company, you know, one brand immersed across all the different countries. So it has allowed us to really hear that personal perspective about, hey, you know, I'm here in, you know, Uruguay, I'm talking and working with somebody in the U.S. And these are the things that you need to consider from a personal standpoint when you are collaborating with me. So all in all, it has been a huge win for us as a company in terms of productivity and international collaboration. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch as different countries reopen in different ways, mm -hmm. um, how, how we as a, as a panel react differently to those who are going back into offices, those who are continuing work from home, um, and those in a hybrid role, especially with schools also in different time, time zones and different, uh, different seasons, we're, we're yeah. facing that as well, which is becoming more evident every day that our, our kids are off on summer, summer vacation right now. Yeah. If I could just share two things that we're doing at Cox. Um, one of the things we're doing is our supervisors right before, similar to you, Pilar, when they start their coaching session, the first five minutes of that coaching session is asking the employee, how are they feeling? Is there anything that they need from a support perspective? And then from a recognition perspective, when an employee identifies an area of opportunity in our process or in how we handle particular calls, we have this um, initiative that we call You Said We Did. And so we gather the feedback from the employee, we get the specifics, and then once we're able to resolve it, we send out a um, enterprise-wide communication highlighting the request that came in from the employee and what we were able to do with it. Um, I love and that. We, yeah, we've seen some great results in that. Now we're getting more and more employees wanting to help us solve business problems. And it allows us to really spotlight those employees that come forward um, and show that it's okay to you know, bring forth an idea on how to improve the business. So that recognition as well is going a long way. Fantastic discussion. We've got a couple of questions, um, four or five questions from the um, attendees. Uh, the first one I see here is customer experience is critical for CRM trends. Um, what do you think of the role of AI and automation, et cetera? Any thoughts on that from the panelists? In its absolute infancy, I don't, I feel mm -hmm. that there's some uh, benefits we've had from machine learning in being able to categorize customers into different segments to, to uh, have, provide a better customer experience. In terms of AI, uh, for us in the, in the advertising and tech space, it's really, really been mostly around where I've seen, been seen it successful in uh, behavioral targeting, but that's about the extent of uh, it. On the employee side, um, we've been using some tools for um, looking at personality trait profiling. Um, okay. There's tools like Crystal that do sort of uh, personality trait profiling on executives and executive teams and, inter and providing recommendations on interactions, how to interact differently with each other. Um, but I, think, I could still think it's quite in its infancy, real customer relationship management. We're still working with people. And I think this pandemic has, it has shown that we actually are, we, we are working with people and people are, are interesting creatures. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we've got another question here that says, what makes you especially interested in customer experience and serving customers well? I love this question. Any, anybody, anybody out there, any of our panelists? For me, it's, it's the, I get warm and fuzzy when I am able to really make an impact on someone's experience. Um, whether that's personally or professionally. Um, and being a servant leader is in my core. And so I get excited. Some people call me creepy, but I get excited about being able to really make a difference in someone's life, um, not just in business, but personally. So I always want to make sure that I treat people the same way um, that I would want to be treated. And I bring that forth to my teams. Um, leading with empathy, Diane, um, making sure that I'm touching base with them on a regular basis from an employee perspective, but even when dealing with customers, what it, ultimately, what is it that you would like for us to do? And then having that discussion to kind of see where we can meet in the middle, or if there are opportunities where I just have to stand firm and, and advise them of what um, I am able to do in a particular situation. So um, 
for me, customer experience is, is in my core. Lakeisha, I think you absolutely nailed it. We're all in leadership roles and we have the ability to impact so many people's lives, not only with employees, but our customers. And it's, it's why I come to work every day. It's what gets me out of bed. It's the, it's the juice. I love it when people ask me what I do for a living. I say, I make people happy. That's what I spend my day doing. I mean, just, you think about like, it's for a company, of course, but it's also about just that human nature. And we all have had good and bad experiences with brands. And how do we make that engaging and rewarding and simple and easy and make our lives easier? So it's a pretty easy answer. Love it. Uh, Who doesn't want to be made happy every day? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joseph. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. But, you know, I think all of us have probably had a role where we're like, why do we do it this way? Right? Why, why are we doing this? And, and uh, you know, when, when you when you take on a role of customer experience, you really transcend all the silos within an organization, right? You got to chase the customer across all the verticals and, and work cross functionally in them. And, and you know, I, Personally, I have a just an insatiable curiosity of why we do things in, in, in certain manners and, and what, what can we do differently, right? So taking on that role of customer experience and, and, and thinking from the customer's perspective, um, you know, when, when you can think broadly across all and, and follow the customer across their journey with, within your organization, um, you can truly make an impact um, and, and change some of these things that have just traditionally probably plagued and people at the front lines go, why do we do it this way, <laughs> right? And then really make that make that change. Yeah, Joseph, you've got the permission to be the rebel who goes in and just shakes things up through all those different departments with a, with, with a common right. vision as to, as to why we're doing this. Very true. <laughs> all right, so we, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Like I there's, said. No, there's no other discipline that really is championing the customer in the organization. Like everybody does it individually, it's just, it's, but there's nobody who gets to helicopter up like we do and, and help be, I call it the mortar between the bricks ensure that that experience is like you said consistent across but also optimized like kitchen share a lot of her her tricks and tips so we are reaching the end of our session and it's been so fun um so we wanted to close out with a very fast lightning round what is the best cx um advice you could give to our attendees today so bullet point answer um dave i'm looking at you go first Okay, um, we heard it a couple of times. Mine would be be clear on your brand promise, number one, focus that into all aspects of your company culture and training and have that reflect in every interaction you have with the customer. Fantastic. Pilar, any thoughts uh, on you? I have to say be really, really clear with your employees what customer experience means because it means something for, you know, it's, it's a very soft, you know, um, term. So be really clear with somebody in finance, somebody in ops, somebody in purchasing what it actually means to them and how they can deliver. Joseph. Yeah, work with your counterparts uh, and, and continue to look at uh, benchmark yourself, right? But we're all in a journey and you're all gonna be in different points of that. Um, and, and you can truly learn from each other and, and this CX community uh, truly wants to help each other uh, be better for, for advocating for the customer. So continue to lean on your partners and, um, um, you know, and, and know that you're just in a journey, it never ends. Lakaisha. Make it easy for your customers to do business with you. Remove redundancies and make it a frictionless experience. Absolutely. And Diane? Tell the human story. Use numbers to back it up, but make sure you tell those stories that resonate with people. Nothing moves them faster than that. Absolutely. Well, you heard it from the panel experts today. Um, lasting CX advice for you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much to our um, panelists for your time today. Um, this is recorded, so it will be sent out to um, all the registered attendees and happy 4th of July. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye. you. Bye.